I'll start us off by giving an example from my own research where I've utilized um, different spectroscopic imaging um, tools in combination with time-dependent density functional theory to elucidate calcium complexation by organic matter in sediments. This work is done um, in collaboration with um, a number of people from Stanford University and SLAC and EMSL. I particularly like to call out Neri Govind and Amity Anderson who will give the two talks following mine. So before I start this research example though, I'm going to give you some background on how we can use molecular tools to understand biogeochemical processes. So as biogeochemists or environmental scientists, we're often interested in understanding how contaminants and nutrients are cycled through the environment at the landscape scale. And um, important to answering these questions is understanding how they're cycling within the subsurface within soils and sediments. And soils and sediments are a complex um, mixture of aggregated materials. So you have mineral particles, organic debris, microbes, um, all um, aggregated together with pore spaces in between filled with aqueous solution and gases. And at the interfaces between these pore spaces and these um, aggregated particles, you have a number of critical interfacial reactions, things like absorption and precipitation and redox that control the chemical form of contaminants and nutrients. And by controlling their chemical form or their chemical speciation, they determine their distribution within soils and sediments, and thus they determine how they move throughout the landscape. So we can use um, chemical imaging spectroscopy and theoretical methods to examine these critical interfacial reactions and also to probe the chemical speciation of these different contaminant and, and nutrients um, or nutrient type elements within the environment. So environmental systems like soils and sediments are extremely heterogeneous and that heterogeneity really challenges our ability to determine um, uh, chemical speciation for specific elements within soils and sediments and understand um, how they're reacting and what's driving those reactions within soils and sediments. And so in my work, I utilize a combination of approaches, um, molecular probes that directly look at coordination environment in combination with microscopic probes that tell me about the physical co-location of different elements and I apply these um, to uh, natural materials that have been manipulated in a laboratory in order to get at um, chemical speciation, often metal speciation, but not limited to metals within environmental systems. Um, the, the focus of this workshop today and the focus of this talk will be particularly on the utility of X-ray absorption spectroscopy and density functional theory, which can probe um, molecular coordination environment. Amity and Neri, who are following me, will give you some background um, on those theoret on the theoretical tools, but I'll spend a little time now to give you an idea of um, what X-ray absorption spectroscopy is um, and how we can use it. Um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy is one of the major tools we utilize at the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source and, and, and light sources generally. And what we do is we use high intensity X-rays, um, illuminate our sample with those high intensity X-rays and use them to excite core level electrons from an element that we're interested in. And those excited electrons then go either into unoccupied anti-bonding orbitals or they're ejected away from the atom entirely. Uh, and go into the continuum. So we, we actually tune the energy of these X-rays to be resonant with um, the energy of these core level electrons for the specific element that we're interested in probing. And then by scanning um, that X-ray energy across the absorption edge or across the ionization threshold for that element of interest and monitoring the um, intensity of the X-rays after they interact with your sample, we obtain an X-ray absor absorption spectrum, which is pictured here. This X-ray absorption spectrum can be separated into two different regions, the Zanes region and the XS region. So that's X-ray absorption near edge structure or Zanes, 
and extended excerption fine structure XFs. Um, very broadly speaking, F XFs provides molecular structure and Zanes provides electronic structure. Well, I won't talk too much about XFs in, in the particular research example I've prepared for you today, um, but you will see XFs presented um, later on by some of our speakers. And so I'll, I'll just give you a, um, a, a brief overview of what this does um, right now. So we can extract an XF signal from this X-ray absorption spectrum. And um, that XF signal is actually, um, can be calculated based on the number of atoms coordinating your atom of interest the bond distances between that atom and surrounding atoms, and also a measure of structural disorder, such that um, you can quantitatively fit this signal and extract information on the local coordination environment. You can do this for crystalline materials, but you can also do this for molecular complexes and anything in between. So it's a really powerful tool for environmental scientists to probe chemical speciation in heterogeneous systems where you may have a large mixture of materials that aren't fully crystalline. Uh, this talk today will focus more on the Zanes region of the X-ray absorption spectrum. And Zanes is useful because it can provide a quantitative probe of the electronic structure and thus the coordination environment. So um, this is an example of an X-ray absorption spectrum. It's actually for, for calcium. And the features in it, which I've highlighted in gray, blue and um, green um, highlight different features, we call them pre-edge peaks, that actually represent electronic transitions um, from that core orbital to antibonding molecular orbitals. So to give you an example of, of what we can do, if we have theory to predict what transitions occur, um, we can assign these different features in the X-ray absorption spectrum to specific transitions between that core level electron and a specific um, antibonding molecular orbital. So um, as we proceed um, by increasing energy, we get to higher and um, higher um, energy orbitals and we can probe, um, we can, uh, we can probe each of these states. So the important thing to take away is that uh, Zanes is actually providing um, the electronic structure. And the electronic structure um, is dependent on the molecular structure. These two things are intimately linked. So if you gain information on one, you can gain information on the other. So for instance, if you have a molecular structure, you can um, predict what the or you can predict um, where those features will appear in the Zanes spectra. Or if you have a Zane spectrum, you can um, predict whether those features are consistent with a particular type of molecular structure. So in the research that I'll present today, I've used a combination of Zanes and TDDFT along with microscopy and, um, and uh, laboratory manipulations of sediments in order to get specifically at calcium speciation in sediments. And the reason that I'm interested in this problem is because um, soils are the largest dynamic pool of carbon in exchange with the atmosphere. Mineral protection, which is the sorption of organic matter to mineral surfaces, can mitigate against organic matter mineralization, that is conversion to carbon dioxide, and then flux of that CO2 into the atmosphere. For a long time, it's been recognized that the clay size fraction can be used to predict soil organic matter content in sediments. However, it's recently been recognized that in certain soils, calcium can also be a, an important predictor of soil organic matter content, which implies that there's a chemical association between these two materials. And um, the reason this could be the case is because calcium is actually an important cation, um, or cation bridger. So it, since it's divalent, it has a divalent charge, it can link together negatively charged functional groups. So these can be negatively charged functional groups on a mineral surface and an organic matter moiety, or it could be between two negatively charged organic matter moieties. There's actually um, computational work or molecular dynamics work that suggests that intersphere bridging, which is a, the stronger form of, of bridging, is particularly relevant for calcium 2 plus related to other divalent ions that are abundant like magnesium 2 plus. 
However, there's limited experimental evidence for this in real or whole soils or sediments. Moreover, there's pretty limited experimental evidence for um, whether there are specific organic ligands that participate in these bridging reactions and which surfaces also participate in these bridging reactions. So the goal of this work was to gain insight into the molecular scale mechanism by which calcium binds organic matter and minerals, causing aggregation of organic matter or absorption of organic matter to mineral surfaces in soils and sediments. So to this end, we investigated um, calcite-rich sediment from a semi-arid shallow aquifer. And first we sought to identify whether calcium in that calcite-rich sediment was in fact associated with organic matter and whether these calcium organic matter um, uh, complexes were associated with specific minerals. Um, and then finally, we sought to determine whether we could um, uh, whether we could tell if there were specific organic ligands that were participating in these um, in, in these calcium organic matter interactions. So the two sediments I collected from this uh, shallow aquifer, I subjected to a, um, a technique called density fractionation. This is a, a separation technique employed by soil scientists to separate out um, light um, or low density organic materials from um, heavy high density uh, mineral particles and sediments. So basically I take the sediment, I suspend it in high density liquids and I come up with three different um, fractions a light fraction that is um, comprises dominantly particulate organic matter, a middle density fraction um, that comprises mineral organic aggregates, and finally a heavy density fraction that's mostly minerals with some organic matter that's strongly associated with those minerals and follows it through the separation process. It's important to note that these high density liquids are also high ionic strength, strength liquids, and so they can actually disrupt um, and are expected to disrupt outer sphere um, interactions um, between calcium or other metals in this, this material and in the, um, the solid phase. So I looked at the um, carbon and the calcium content for these different density fractions for my two different sediments. And not surprisingly, I could see that the carbon content was highest in the light fraction, lowest in the heavy fraction. The calcium content um, is distributed across all fractions. And this led me to think that the, the recovery of calcium in the light in the middle fractions is an indicator that calcium could be absorbed to organic matter, in particular in the light fraction, because this is so abundant in carbon. But to test this idea, I wanted to use uh, microscopy to probe whether calcium was actually uh, physically co-located with carbon. So I utilized nanosecondary ion mass spectrometry or nanosims, which provided the um, elemental distribution of calcium um, shown in this plot here, which I've then compared to the distribution of carbon and aluminum in um, green and blue respectively in this plot here. And we can see a couple things. First, um, we can plot the intensity of calcium versus carbon for all pixels present within this image and compare it to that of calcium versus aluminum. And what we see is that where um, the intensity of carbon is higher, also the intensity of calcium is generally higher as well, an indication that those two are separated, or sorry, associated. Um, moreover, if we actually look at individual um, calcium hotspots, some of these are pointed out by the arrows in this image, we can see that they are, um, they co-occur with carbon particles that exhibit the same morphology. And so we conclude that there's a particle that contains both carbon and calcium uh, mixed into it or as physically associated. These particles are then enmeshed in a matrix of aluminosilicate particles. So you get these much bigger aluminum particles that the, the carbon and, and calcium are sort of stuck on but aren't, aren't um, chemically a part of. So this, the, the nanosims really allows us to say like, yes, calcium and, and carbon are co-associated. And I forgot to mention um, that the uh, sort of spatial resolution of nanosims is approximately 150 nanometers um, in, these, in these images. 
However, NanoSIMS is providing us elemental distribution and it's not providing us anything about the speciation of carbon. And so we can't tell whether this is carbonate or inorganic carbon or whether it's organic. So for that, we turn to scanning transmission X-ray microscopy or Stixum, which provides the uh, which provides an, a carbon X-ray absorption spectrum for every single pixel within a two-dimensional map. Um, so um, if you look at this uh, white boxed area, this is actually an area with, a high, with high calcium concentration. And we can look at the carbon X-ray absorption spectra um, for this particle. I've shown a representative spectrum of that here. The peaks in this spectrum cor correspond to different um, carbon functional groups. And so what we observe is that one, there's no carbonate peak. Um, so this is not an inorganic carbon particle. And two, um, this particle contains um, a high phenol peak, which is about, at about 287 eV. Phenol is um, rich in lignin and plant-derived materials, and so we've inferred that this must be some sort of lignin-derived material that calcium is associated with in the light fraction. Um, so this is a, a light fraction of one of the sediments, and we've also used the same method to look at the calcium distribution in the um, middle density fraction, which is this um, nominal organic mineral aggregate fraction. And again, we see the same trends. We see calcium particles that exhibit the same morphology as carbon particles enmeshed in these larger aluminum particles. And using Stixum, we can see this carbon is organic. And um, in this particular example, it's a carboxylate rich microbially derived material. Um, I have one more example from you for you from the middle fraction. And again, we see the same um, uh, this, the, the same uh, co-association between calcium and carbon. And we actually see different types of um, organic material. Again, we see this phenol-rich material, but we also see a carboxylate-rich material um, that could be associated with directly with mineral particles. Um, so what we've learned using these uh, nanoscale microscopies is that um, we can detect calcium associated with organic material. We see calcium organic particles embedded in an aluminosilicate matrix, and we can identify calcium associated um, with specific plant and microbial sorbents, um, but then also with organic material that's been degraded to the point where it's not uh, readily identifiable as having been derived from either of these sources. So this is great, but it doesn't tell us about the, the, the calcium binding to organic matter per se. So what is the actual chemical form of calcium in these systems? And how does it bond to the organic matter? So we've attempted to answer this question using calcium cage Zane spectroscopy. And so this technique is probing um, the excitation of a calcium 1s electron into um, those uh, molecular orbitals. And what I'm showing you here is actually just um, what I call the bulk spectra. So these, we use a large beam and we get uh, a, a large representative area of the sample measured. And I've done this measurement for the light, middle, and heavy density fractions, as well as the whole sediment. And what you can see right off the bat by comparison to the spectrum for calcite or calcium carbonate is that the dominant form of calcium in the whole sediment is calcite and it that dominates the features in the Zane spectrum and that that calcite is separated primarily into the heavy fraction when you do this density fractionation. The middle and the light fraction, those Zanes exhibit um, distinct features from calcium carbonate. And so, you know, we'd like to know, okay, we expect calcium to be bound to organics based on these, uh, uh, this nanoscale microscopy. Do these Zane spectra represent calcium bound to organic matter. Um, however, these Zane spectra, as I mentioned, they represent sort of like a, an average um, calcium, uh, the, the average calcium speciation for a, a, a large area from any one of these samples. And so we, we anticipate that there's probably really a number of different calcium species that contribute um, to the final Zane spectrum that you see. And so it's pretty difficult to just analyze the bulk spectrum um, right off the bat. So instead, what we did is we used the tender X-ray microprobe available at SSRL 
um, which gives us the calcium distribution um, with a spatial resolution of five microns. And so we can map out the distribution of calcium relative to sulfur, phosphorus, also aluminum and silicon, which I'm not showing here. And in doing so, we can spatially discriminate between different calcium um, bearing materials. Um, so we can then go to these different calcium hotspots, which you see in green here, and we can collect a micro zane spectrum. So a zane spectrum just collected from that five micron area. And I chose areas to do these micro zanes um, uh, measurements based on whether calcium was co-associated with sulfur, phosphorus, silica, or aluminum primarily. And in, in, in selecting the zanes this way, I was able to obtain um, three distinct types of spectra shown in the red, the gray, and the blue here. Um, the red and the gray spectra um, are very likely um, different types of mineral calcium, um, likely a, a, a calcium phosphate, um, and then um, a, a feldspar. But the blue spectra don't match um, the spectra for any, any mineral compounds. Moreover, these spectra um, were found in hotspots where we also saw hotspots of sulfur. Um, and one piece of information that I haven't given you is that sulfur in these particular sediments, there's a large amount of organic sulfur. And so it might be that by looking at areas that are specifically uh, high in calcium and sulfur, we're actually looking at using sulfur as a proxy for organics. And we're sort of picking out calcium associated with organics. We see um, the same, that was an example from the light um, density fraction. We see the same thing if we look at the middle density fraction. Again, you see these, um, these zane spectra here, which aren't consistent with a specific mineral, um, calcium mineral. And they were found in areas that had high sulfur. So, this in combination with the nanoscale microscopy makes us think, okay, well maybe these zane spectra represent calcium bound to organic material. So we're hypothesizing um, that, that these spectra represent calcium bound to organic matter. And now we'd like to use um, time dependent density functional theory to determine whether features in these um, sample zane spectra are consistent with different coordinating ligands and different molecular geometries for calcium. So uh, we started to answer this question by um, obtaining Zane's uh, spectra for different calcium model compounds, calcium coordinated to EDTA, calcium oxalate, and solvated calcium or calcium surrounded by, by water molecules. And then we um, simulated these Zane spectra using time-dependent density functional theory. And importantly, we can see that the um, time-dependent density functional theory accurately predicts the position of the white line in um, these model compounds. Um, moreover, we actually see a, a blue shift in the white line as we go from calcium EDTA to oxalate to solvated calcium. And this shift in the, um, in the white line energy is commensurate with an increase in the symmetry around the calcium center. So calcium in EDTA is fairly distorted. And as you go to oxalate and solvated calcium, you approach a more octahedral, or that's a high, um, highly symmetric um, coordination geometry for calcium. So now we can overlay um, these model compounds with one of the sample spectra. And so this is a representative sample spectra. I'm only showing one to sort of simplify this plot. But what you can see is that the white line of the sample spectra aligns well with that of calcium EDTA and is redshifted relative to oxalate and solvated calcium, suggesting to us that something about the calcium coordinated to EDTA is a better representation of that calcium coordination environment in organic matter than say something like calcium oxalate. Um, so we then um, extended this analysis by using density functional theory to optimize geometries for um, calcium bound to different functional groups other than um, sort of carboxylate functional groups. So we do have um, calcium bound to aspartate, which is an amino acid. Um, calcium bound to O-phosphoroethanolamine, which is an analog for the head group on um, phospholipids, and then um, calcium diphenolate, um, which we're interested in because 
um, we saw a lot of phenol rich organic matter so, um, uh, present in this system. So we can ge uh, geometry optimize these systems and then we can utilize time dependent DFT to then predict um, the Zane spectra for these ge um, geometry optimized um, molecules and then ask whether this is consistent with um, the sample spectra. So this shows a plot of all of the different um, TDDFT simulated Zane spectra on the bottom here um, relative to the sample spectra. First, what we see is that when calcium is coordinated to the carboxylate phosphate ester or the phenolate, those geometries are um, distorted away from the octahedral geometry. And they also exhibit the same sort of white line shift relative to solvated calcium and calcium oxalate that EDTU, EDTA does. Um, so this actually means that the um, calcium coordinated to these um, different functional groups yields transitions um, that are consistent with the position of the white line spectrum of the sample. So based solely on analysis of the white line position, we can't actually discriminate between um, carboxylate phosphate ester and phenolate functional groups bound to calcium. Um, however, um, we are continuing this work um, by assessing how the pre-edge position and intensity for all of these different compounds varies as a function of the coordinating ligands. You can see here that the, um, the, the pre-edge feature varies intensity quite a bit as you go across this, this particular series. And so we hope that um, in comparison to the sample spectra, we'll be able to obtain um, information about whether there are specific ligands that can be ruled out as, as complex in calcium in this system. So in doing this work, um, we have been able to conclude um, that calcium is strongly complexed by organic matter in calcareous, um, in these high calcite containing sediments. Um, we concluded this using nanoscale maps that show calcium organic particles embedded in an aluminosilicate matrix. We then sought to use calcium microzane spectroscopy and TDDFT to um, analyze the calcium coordination environment of those calcium um, organic particles. And we're able to assess that calcium um, forms inner sphere complexes with um, oxygen based functional groups like carboxylate, um, phosphate ester, phenolate um, in a distorted coordination environment. So non octahedral, um, consistent with um, seven fold coordination of calcium. We have, we have not yet been able to conclude whether there are specific types of functional groups that calcium preferentially binds to in this system. So I hope that um, provides for you um, an uh, example of how we can really combine all of these different spectroscopic imaging tools um, together at multiple scales um, with theory to gain some insight into the molecular form of calcium and its distribution within an actual real sediment. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, thank you for your attention. And I'd also like to thank my collaborators at Stanford, SSRL, CLS, EMSL, PNNL, um, and um, point out that this work really relied upon the use of multiple different user facilities, um, the Canadian Light Source um, as well as, as SSRL and EMSL um, in order to, to pull this project together. So um, with that, I'd like to um, ask for any questions that you might have. And um, so you all are able to unmute yourself